Welcome to the latest episode of Shannon's Club TV. If you've been following the show, you've no doubt enjoyed reliving some great stories about Australian road and race cars. In each show, we uncover the defining moments in our feature car's history and meet a proud owner. We'll also get the latest news from the Shannon's Auctions team. But for now, let's get things rolling with the car that was an instant failure, but became one of Jaguar's biggest success stories. The Jaguar XJS. There is no way of sugarcoating the 1975 arrival of the Jaguar XJS. As a replacement for the ageing but much loved E-Type, the XJS was a spectacular jaw dropper for all the wrong reasons. The XJS might have been a beautiful car trying to get out, but it was destroyed by British Leyland detailing and quality as only British Leyland could. The sad 15,000 sales recorded globally in its first five years says it all. Then just before it slipped into the automotive knackers yard, sales took off just as dramatically, generating a 21-year production run of over 115,000 cars and an unbeaten model life for a Jaguar. Mark, the XJS and its reversal of fortune is often linked with motor racing. But that's not the full story. No, it certainly wasn't in the case of the XJS. Keep in mind that you know, the American Bob Tullius had a huge amount of success in an XJS in Trans Am racing in the US, but that didn't make any difference to the car's initial sales. What really started to turn things around was Jaguar improving the, the quality of the road car, tied with the successes that Tom Walkinshaw Racing was having in Europe. Only with those two together did the sales start to turn around. And you know, I think it proves motor racing on its own doesn't sell more cars. Yes, especially when British Leyland's around too. <laughs> exactly. Well, the XJS had all the credentials for a runaway success the instant it was launched. Exotic V12 mechanicals in a sleek coupe with benchmark ride and handling had never been so accessible. Yet not even early XJS track success in the US could counter the excessive thirst and soggy feel of the road car. The disconnect was too great. Then Swiss engineer Michael May developed new fireball heads that cut the V12 fuel consumption by up to 20% and boosted power. It added engineering integrity just as memories of fuel shortages were fading and soon justified a renewed global competition campaign. The V12 HE, as it was called, was only the start of mini mechanical and cosmetic upgrades. By the end of 1981, the new engine, new exterior bright work, and a luxury wooden leather interior had transformed the XJS. The sales turnaround was instant. After global sales plummeted to 1,057 in 1980, they had crept back up to over 3,000 in 1982. As the connection between the road cars and a fresh new racetrack presence became more credible, annual sales rocketed to almost 11,000 globally. When the last XJS was built in 1996, it was still holding its own in desirability. Mark, if there ever was a textbook case of a product-led recovery in the showroom and on the racetrack, mm. the XJS would have to be it. Sure would. And local sales in Australia got a huge boost from a famous Bathurst victory in 1985. The 1985 Bathurst 1000 was one of the most exciting and memorable in the history of the great race, thanks largely to Tom Walkinshaw Racing and its trio of howling V12 Jaguar XJS coupes that delivered a popular win for the British team. The burly Scotsman was determined to extract his revenge on the mountain after failing to get off the start line the previous year due to a transmission failure in the locally developed XJS he shared with car owner and former Bathurst winner John Goss. On his return, Walkinshaw ensured nothing was left to chance, armed with the same cars that had blitzed arch-rival BMW in the 1984 European Touring Car Championship. The professionalism of the TWR Jaguar operation was hard to fault, displaying all the discipline and experience of a well-drilled factory team battle-hardened by three seasons of intense European competition. Joe, I'll never forget the effect that this team had on the Australian audience. You know, the look and the sound of those V12 race cars, they must have made prestige buyers look at the XJS, you know, in a whole new light. Well, it did, but they were very expensive. Yeah. And you didn't quite get that presence in the road car, but mm. they were very nice by that time, but they were 10 years old. Mm. They'd been around a long time, and they'd come through a very bad period. And I guess if you had the money, you might get excited about it. But straight after that, in 1986, we had unleaded petrol, 
and the whole car was wound back <laughs> yet again. So it was a very short uh, purple patch, I would think. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The three Bathurst cars were the best of the TWR XJS races. Built right down to the category weight limit and with more than 500 brake horsepower from their highly developed V12 engines. The Jaguars set the three fastest times in official practice on Friday before Walkinshaw secured pole position on Saturday with a scintillating lap in the Hardy's Heroes top 10 shootout that is still revered today. Despite their impressive speed and preparation, the race didn't exactly go to plan for TWR. One of the three Jaguars retired early with engine damage, while another, driven by local hero John Goss, suffered a broken seat which continued to fracture as the race progressed. Having led most of the race, Walkinshaw also struck trouble when an engine oil cooler was punctured by a stone, needing an agonisingly long stop for repairs that cost him any chance of claiming the personal Bathurst victory he really wanted. Even so, despite all the challenges the mountain could throw at them, the TWR Jaguars claimed first and third places in a formation finish, led by race winner John Goss. It was Jaguar's first victory in Australia's greatest motor race, ensuring the mighty XJS its immortal status as a Bathurst winner. You can read many other great road and race stories on the Shannon's Club website. My name's Mike Roddy, we're at Sandown Raceway in Melbourne and this is my Jaguar XJS TWR Group A race car. It's of course the Bathurst winner from 1985 with John Goss and Armin Hahn driving. Won the race with those two drivers and set fastest lap. All the tech specifications on this car are uh, the uh, engine, it's got a lot of Cosworth derived parts, it runs two oil pumps, it's got very high quality valve springs and uh, reciprocating parts within it. It'll spin all day long between six and seven and a half thousand RPM and more if necessary. Interesting points, the wheels, the Speedline wheels are 12 inch, so plenty of rubber on the road and they're very durable and uh, long lasting sort of parts like most things on this. It's built to run 24 hours flat out and it would still do it. It's got coolers all over it and pumps. It's got a gearbox oil cooler in the scuttle. It's got two diff coolers under the back. It's got two massive oil coolers up front. Big AP racing brakes all around, all adjustable from inside the car. Specification, as were in 1984, they've never been changed, apart from when it was upgraded at the factory in 86 to come back for Bathurst, which unfortunately never did happen. Favourite memory with this car was probably the first time I ever drove it out at Winton. Just so much history involved with the car and it was a big job for us to go and get it from overseas and bring it back here. That was a great memory, just those first few laps. Speed wise with this car we've had it at Bathurst, virtually on the rev limiter, so about close to 8,000 RPM, about 270k coming down Conrod Strait. It's pretty comfortable at that, I don't know whether I was though. <laughs> well I've owned it for a bit over 10 years, we've raced it every year in the historics, mainly at Sandown, Winton, up at Oran Park when that was still running and we ran it at the Tom Walkinshaw Tribute at uh, Clipsal, which was fantastic, with, uh, had his wife and son there and had all the V8 supercar drivers with the car and then I took it for a couple of laps as a tribute to Tom Walkinshaw. Uh, that was a great day, one of the many great days we've had with this car. <laughs> Shannon's National Auctions Manager Chris Borovan joins us for the latest on the Jaguar XJS. Hi Chris. Hello. Welcome Hi. to the show mate. Thank you. The Jaguar XJS, I mean, what kind of buyer demographic are we talking about? Is this someone who wanted an E-Type say and then they've had to settle for that because they can't afford it or is, is, does the XJS have its own dedicated group of enthusiasts? What's going on out there? 
Yeah, I think they do have their own uh, dedicated group of buyers. Mm. Um, I think, you know, there, there is a passion there, obviously, for uh, E-type buyers, but mm. uh, I think the XJS uh, buyer is probably slightly different as well. Mm. Um, you know, they probably aspired to buy the cars in the late 70s and, and 80s, and, and now with the price is yeah, so it's affordable. Right down, absolutely, yeah. and it's, uh, it make, makes it a great buy. Okay. Mm. When I was in the UK in about 77, when they first came out, uh, the mechanics who were working on them said, uh, running costs are about akin to a light aeroplane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. they were in the early Leyland days when yep. you know, the joke used to be if you dropped a, a washer or a nut, it never hit the ground. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> mm. They certainly got more reliable, but I guess the real point is here is the purchase price is one thing, mm. owning it is another. I mean, it, it, exactly right. It can be that way. And I think that's why we always recommend, you know, try and find a good Australian delivered car, something with, you know, potentially fairly low miles if you can, but also great maintenance history. Uh, that's probably the key to it. And if you get a car like that, that's a lot of car for, it for is. the money, isn't Absolutely it? Absolutely today, yeah. It's been well looked after, it's got a good um, you know, service history. Yep. yep. Yeah, but but a V12 game. has 12 spark plugs, it has exactly uh, extra cams and all of that sort of yep. stuff. And that's yep. that you've just got to have that mindset. Mm. Um, Maintain it, have a regular maintenance routine yeah. and never fall behind. And otherwise the car really is unsaleable, yeah. isn't it? And pro probably a good favoured car also in a club scene today. I think we're yeah. probably seeing... Well, know, it is a, a two yeah. plus two, so yes. like it's practical. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think it's a sort of car that you can easily drive to any event, keeps up with modern traffic very easily. Mm. Um, so I think it's, it's favoured with the, with the club uh, scene as well. Chris, there's a real variety of XJS. Mm. There's yeah. early ones, later ones with the HE heads. There's a Tickford Cabriolet, there's a full convertible, yep. there's a six-cylinder with a rear manual option. That's right. And the yeah. very last of them, which were a totally open convertible with the new tail yep. and V12. How do, how do we value those and <laughs> what's the hierarchy? Bit of a choice. It, it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of it's, uh, you know, personal taste. But, mm. uh, you know, I think the later HX Coupes are quite mm. popular. Mm. Uh, and also I think the last of the convertibles are great cars. Yeah. Uh, so they're probably the two to be looking at. Thanks, Chris. And don't forget, you can get all the latest auction news on the Shannon's Club website. If you'd like to own your own image of the Jaguar XJS in competition, you'll find them all at Autopic's incredible photo archive. Joe, the XJS, you know, that car is really black and white for me. I absolutely love those TWR race cars. They were so exciting, but that excitement for me never translated to the showroom product. Well, you wouldn't be alone, mm. um, but I must say that period was critical in keeping Jaguar alive. Yeah. Of course, they were purchased by Ford not much later, which uh, gave the car, uh, gave the company a real injection of life. Mm. In the meantime, they were struggling on ten-year-old product. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it, it was a classic case of racing on Sunday, not selling on Monday, mm. but it brought the Jaguar profile right up at the time it was needed. And it, I think, yeah. it, and, yeah. and, and especially with the sedans and the later Cabriolet, yeah. and I think it gave Jaguar a short reprieve. Mm. And then when Ford got into the company and cleaned it up and t started turning out some really nice cars, yeah. um, it, it's been very strong in this country. But I think that period, uh, I reckon that racing saved them. Mm. There's no doubt in my mind, in this country anyway. Yeah, for sure. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this look back at the Jaguar XJS and we'll catch you next time on Channel's Club TV.